Welcome, dear listeners, to another episode of The Real Crime Diary. I'm your host, delving into the darkest corners of criminal history, uncovering stories that shock the conscience, illuminate the past, and challenge what we think we know about the human psyche. In the labyrinth of history's most dastardly villains, some names sound a chilling echo that reverberates through time. Today, we unravel the macabre tale of murder and deception that cast a shadow over France in the late 1850s. This is the story of Martin Dumoulard, a name that may not be as infamous as other figures in the annals of crime, but whose brutal acts left an indelible mark on the era. Journey back with me to 19th century Lyon, where a predator lurked, hunting the most vulnerable. Women sought work, stability, and hope, but for some their trust in a stranger paved a grim path to tragedy. Who was this French serial killer, and how did his heinous crimes terrorize the maids of Lyon? All answers will emerge as we explore, together, the dark depths of real crime. Stay with me for a story that is both a gruesome reflection of one man and a haunting portrait of an era. Welcome to The Real Crime Diary. The tangled web of Martin Dumollard's early years is as ominous as the crimes he would later commit. Born in the bucolic town of Dagnu in 1810, Dumoulard entered a world troubled from the start. His father, Pierre Dumoulard, a native of Hungary, was a man already marked by infamy, harboring a criminal past that he could not escape. It was a legacy that would ultimately cast a grim shadow over the younger Dumoulard's life. The Dumoulard family, constantly on the move between Dagnu and Tramoy, struggled under the weight of this dark inheritance. When the Austro-Hungarian forces arrived in Ain in 1814, Pierre's past caught up with him his fear of recognition driving him to flee, only to meet a gruesome fate, executed by dismemberment. Martin, a mere child of four, witnessed this horrifying event alongside his mother, Marie-Joseph de Ray. It's the kind of trauma that ripples through time, the kind that shapes a person in profound and often disturbing ways. As if in a tragic echo of his father's flight, Martin, too, found himself escaping to Lyon to evade the consequences of theft, leaving his impoverished mother behind in Dagner, where she would later die alone. The young Dumoulard sought refuge in shepherd work, and it was during this pastoral existence that he crossed paths with Marie-Anne Martinet. It was a fateful encounter, as she would later become both his wife and accomplice in the string of unspeakable acts that terrified France. Working as a shepherd under Guichard at the Shore Castle, Martin's seemingly mundane life belied the sinister urges growing within him. The couple married in 1840 and settled in Le Montelier, but the semblance of a quiet rural life could not quell the darkness lurking in Dumoulard's heart. The stage was set for a transformation that baffles and horrifies us to this day. How did this shepherd, this seemingly ordinary man, twist into one of France's first recorded serial killers? As we delve deeper into the life of Martin Dumoulard, it's clear that the scars of his youth never faded. The shadows of his father's malevolent legacy loomed large, creating an inescapable chasm between the man and the monster he was to become. In the loneliness of those wooded expanses and rural highways of Cotier, amid the shepherd's fields and quiet villages, a predator was born. A predator who would come to be known as the Terror of Lyon. Let's peel back the layers of deception that Martin Dumoulard masterfully crafted in his terrible spree. Picture a man who roamed the bustling streets of Lyon. This man had a tactic, a sinister hook, the promise of employment. A job to most represents opportunity, a fresh start, and Dumoulard knew exactly how to exploit such hope. He presented himself as an employer, offering domestic work with attractive wages to young girls, fresh from the countryside, eager to support their families. Imagine the relief and excitement these women must have felt, securing what sounded like a dream position in a nicer house up in Cotier. Most would jump at such a chance, oblivious to the nightmare that awaited them. Now let's delve into how Dumoulard executed his treacherous plots. Envision a scene where a young girl is approached, her mind brimming with dreams of a better future, her heart filled with naive trust. As she journeys with Dumoulard, the landscape shifts, the city's edge gives way to rural isolation, the path to opportunity narrowing into a dangerous trap. The true horror lay in what unfolded next, assaults of extreme violence. Dumoulard wasn't satisfied with merely luring his victims, his intent was to obliterate their very existence. 
They were brutalized, their dignity stripped away, and for some, their final breaths were taken in the most unimaginable circumstances. Reflect upon the case of Marie Ulali Boussoud, whose story epitomizes the depth of Dumoulard's depravity. Believing she was embarking on a journey to stable employment, she instead met with a fate so vile, one that shook the core of the local community. Listeners, what chills me the most is the routine nature of his deceit. Like a predator perfecting his technique, Dumoulard repeated his method with a chilling precision. Over and over again he cast his deadly net, waiting for his next victim to take the bait. This reflection brings forth a grim reality. The very structures of society, ones that should have been safe havens, became tools of entrapment. The concept of work, a noble pursuit, was perverted into a lethal lure. Dumoulard turned the mundane act of seeking employment into a convoluted game of life and death. By dissecting Dumoulard's modus operandi, we see the cold calculation of a man who was not merely content with violence, but was driven by it. He drew his victims away from the safety of public eyes, walking them towards their doom with the promise of a better life that was never to be theirs. Through this we gain not just insight into the mind of a serial killer, but also a stark reminder. Appearances often mask the darkest truths, and trust can sometimes be the most dangerous offering of all. Stay with me as we continue to unlock the harrowing chapters of Martin Dumoulard's legacy. As we peel back the layers of Martin Dumoulard's grisly crimes, there's one case that casts a particularly haunting shadow. The specter of death in the Montmain woods. The darkness of these woods became the final resting place for a woman whose identity eluded capture, just as she did in life. The story unfolds like a ghastly jigsaw puzzle, beginning with Marie-Anne Martinet's disturbing testimony. It was during one of her interrogations on a stifling July day that Martinet, Dumoulard's wife and accomplice, recounted a bone-chilling tale. She spoke of an evening, four years prior, when Dumoulard returned home with a grim trophy, gold earrings from a victim. But that wasn't all. He went back into the night back to Montman to bury what he had done. It's one thing to hear of murder, but the cold realization that a body has been concealed so close, so secretly, stirs a sense of dread that chills to the bone. Judge Gennad, armed with this specter of a clue, led a team into the depths of Montmain Woods, their ominous quest to uncover what Dumoulard tried to Erasi. On that July 31st, as Gennad and his team skewered the woods, reality proved it more horrifying than fiction. The earth gave up its gruesome a secret, the decomposed body of a woman disposed of in the very woods that Dumoulard knew so well. Imagine for a moment being the townspeople of Pisae, learning that a young woman met such a cruel fate amidst the familiar trees. Picture the impact, the pained need to engrave her memory into the landscape itself. Marie Olali Boussaud's name would be immortalized on two crosses, one upon the very place where her life was so violently taken, bearing the heart-wrenching plea, De Profundis. But what of the other women, those who vanished into the void without a name? How many fell prey to Dumoulard, their fates embodied in the silent witness of the Montmain woods? The specter of death that lingered there was not just a single entity, but a multitude of lost souls, each with their own untold stories of horror and despair. This case, enshrouded in the musty mist of the woodlands, reveals more than just the depravity of one man. It echoes the silent screams of the nameless, the forgotten, whose only testament to existence might just be a whispered tale of terror on the wind. And so we're left wondering, haunted by the specter that is the Montmain Woods, how many more innocently walked alongside Dumoulard, oblivious that their footsteps were being etched into his grim chronicle of death. Among the eerie tales of Martin Dumoulard's sinister spree stands a series of narrow escapes, testimonies from women who teetered on the brink of death yet lived to tell their harrowing stories. These accounts are more than just chilling. They were the breadcrumbs that eventually led to Dumoulard's capture. One woman, Julie Fargit, was approached by Dumoulard in Lyon. A mixture of desperation and hope led her to accept his offer of employment. But as darkness cloaked the sky on their journey, Dumoulard's intentions became alarmingly clear. He attacked, greedily grabbing at Fargit's belongings, her last bit of savings but Fargit was not going silently into that cold night. She screamed with such vigor that Dumoulard fled into the shadows from whence he came. 
Her cries of distress captured the attention of nearby villagers, who came to her aid. Then there was Victorine Perrin, who fell for Dumoulard's deceitful tongue and followed him, anticipating a better life ahead. Dumoulard carried her most precious items in a small trunk that soon vanished along with him into the woods of Neyron. Perrin was left with nothing but her life, which she narrowly held on to. Another tale of survival came from Louise Michel, who found herself at the mercy of Dumoulard's violent tendencies. With threat looming close, and Dumoulard demanding whatever meager funds she possessed, Michel managed an escape under what must have felt like divine intervention. She found sanctuary in the care of Claude Amond, a farmer whose land she stumbled onto, shaken but safe. It was not just the testimonies themselves that were critical, but the connections between them. Simon and Louis Mallet were a father and son duo who unwittingly thrice stumbled upon Dumoulard's trail of terror, the first during the flight of Julie Fargit, again when Louise Michel appeared on their land, and once more when they confronted a defiant Dumoulard after Michel's escape. It was these three stories woven together by survival and coincidence that began to form a net around the predator of Léon. Jean-Marie Bourgeois, suspecting her journey with Dumoulard was leading to disaster, fled to the first signs of refuge she saw, the Politain farm. And Olympe Aloubert, assaulted in the isolated stretches around Mionnet, managed to slip from Dumoulard's grasp and find help with the Barbet family. Each story, a piece of a sinister puzzle that law enforcement painstakingly pieced together, step by bloody step, toward Dumoulard's capture. These survivors... These courageous women not only saved themselves but contributed to saving countless others from the same fate. Their stories, etched into the annals of criminal history, became key testimony in the trial against the man whose name resounded terror across Lyon, Martin Dumoulard. In today's bone-chilling segment, we're peeling back the layers of one of the most harrowing murders at the hands of Martin Dumoulard, the death of Marie Ulali Boussad. It was early 1861 when three worried sisters stepped into the light to report the vanishing of their sibling. Marie Olali, described as diligent and trusting, never would have guessed her hunt for employment was a trap set by a predator. Picture the era. No social media, no smartphones, just word of mouth and the hopeful innocence of a job opportunity. That's exactly what led Boussod into Dumoulard's sinister snare. It was a classic ruse a respectable job offer, a journey to commence work, and then the abrupt plummet into darkness. For precious Marie Ulali, the nightmare began with a man visiting her home, a conversation that promised a future and a departure that would tragically be her last. The investigation unfolded like a macabre jigsaw puzzle. Judge Ginod, tasking himself with the pursuit of the truth, unfolded testimonies and examined evidence that led him to a heart-rending discovery. The shocks came, one after the other, on a summer's day when the words of Marie Dumoulard's own wife revealed a gruesome act. As the team scoured the Pizai woods, anticipation hung heavy like the summer heat. And there, beneath the earth, lay the proof they needed. Marie Ulali, buried by the murderous hands that lured her with lies, her fate sealed with violence and deceit. Now what grips the soul is not just the inhumanity of the act— but the response had stirred in the hearts of the public. The community was outraged, the horror too close to breathe. Driven by an eruption of collective emotion, two simple wooden crosses were erected, silent sentinels to a life snuffed out too early. The first, a devout de profundis, stood in the woods of the dead, marking the spot where innocence was stolen and a villainous deed was done. The second rested in the solemn solitude of a Pisai cemetery, its inscription a testament to the indelible scar left on the fabric of society. Herein lies the question, though. Why do we raise monuments to remember such calamity? Perhaps it's a silent pledge, a communal declaration that while we cannot rewrite the past, we stand watchful against the dark tales that remind us. Evil walks among us, but can be overcome by the light of justice and memory. This story... It isn't just about the chill that traces your spine or the gasp of horror that escapes your lips. It's a wound in our history, a stark reminder that once, under the guise of a guardian, a ghoul prowled through the Montmain woods, turning hope into horror. This is a story we must not forget, for the shadow of Martin Dumoulard should forever be a beacon, an ever-burning torch, reminding us to hold tight to our compassion and our vigilance so that the lives of innocents like Marie Ulali Boussod 
are forever honored and never forsaken. Imagine, if you will, the quiet, unsuspecting streets of Lyon in the spring of 1861. It was here that Marie Pichon, a woman whose name would soon be etched into the annals of criminal history, met Martin Dumoulard. He presented himself as a beacon of hope, offering a job with a good pay that seemed too good to pass up in those times of hardship. Marie's story is one of grave dangers and remarkable courage, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. It all began on the fateful day of May 28th. Pichon, perhaps hopeful for the future, gathered her few belongings with dreams of a new beginning as a maid in the quiet village of Dagnu. She accompanied Dumoulard to Montluel, not knowing that the path she walked would lead to a terrifying ordeal. As darkness engulfed the woods to the heights of Dagnu, Dumoulard's sinister intentions unfurled. In a horrifying turn of events, an assault was launched. Dumoulard attempted to strangle Marie with a lariat his instrument to silence the life out of her. But Marie Pichon wasn't just any unsuspecting victim. She was a fighter. With every last ounce of her being, she fought against the Reaper's grip and broke free from the looming shadow of death. Marie's heart pounded as she ran, her every breath laden with the terror of being pursued. She stumbled upon the Jolie farm in Balan, where she found a haven and a sympathetic ear in Mr. Jolie. It was her detailed recount of the harrowing attack and the vivid description of her assailant that rang the alarm bells. The echoes of her description reverberated through the local authorities, a reminder of another similar account. With each word that Marie expressed, the realization dawned. They were facing a repeat offender. The investigators turned their attention to Martin de Millard, known in the village of Dagneu as simply Raymond. A swift visit to Dumoulard's dwelling followed, and the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. The investigative trail was hot, and on June 2, 1861, Dumoulard's fate was sealed with the click of his arresting shackles. In the annals of crime, there are moments that pivot the course of history. Marie Pichon's brave escape was one such moment. Her willingness to confront and identify Dumoulard not only brought an end to his reign of terror, but also saved countless others from a tragic fate. This stark reminder stands heroes can emerge even in the darkest of times, their bravery lighting a candle in the pitch-black night. Marie Pichon, I assert, is not merely a survivor of a wicked intent, but a beacon of courage in the face of pure evil. Her story is a poignant chapter in the fight against inhumanity, and her name, a testament to the steely resolve in us all to overcome darkness with light. The Martin Dumoulard trial was a spectacle of justice that drew the eyes of not only the local townsfolk, but also those from across the nation. It was January 29, 1862, and the Bourg-en-Bresse court brimmed with anticipation as the whispers of a crowded assembly of 4,000 to 5,000 souls murmured anxiously. The communal appetite for justice was palpable. Ladies and gentlemen, picture this. A courtroom that has become the stage for a harrowing narrative, where the grim chapter of Dumoulard's reign of terror would finally be closed. Curiosity mingled with horror as journalists from prominent periodicals took their positions, pens at the ready. The only thing louder than the clattering of horse carriages bringing in the throngs of onlookers were the pounding hearts of an outraged public. The prosecution was poised as a triumvirate of Avengers, Louis Golot, Prandier, Joachim Jandet. These men, on behalf of an aching society, demanded accountability. They burned with the fervor to see Dumoulard and his accomplice wife, Marie-Anne Martinet, faced the music of their morbid duet. Two defense attorneys, Marius Lardier and Mr. Villeneuve, represented Dumoulard. Now let's set the scene. The couple, intertwined by vows and vicious acts, stood to confront their fate. They were interrogated in succession, each detail etching deeper the tragedy of their crimes into the annals of French criminal history. As Prosecutor Louis Gallot towered before the crowd, you could almost feel the collective breath of the courtroom hold. He painted a picture not of an isolated criminal, but of a killer within a community who once moved amongst them, cloaked by the veil of everyday life. The prosecution's voice, steady and daunting, recounted the narrative each victim would never tell. It was a tapestry of terror, woven with every recounted assault, every stolen breath of the innocents whom Dumoulard and his wife had ensnared in their diabolical web. Then came the personal belongings, hundreds of victims' items seizing the air from the room with their silent stories. As the jury absorbed the sea of artifacts, 
the garters, the stockings, the petticoats, the reality of Dumoulard's macabre collection struck a chilling chord. These weren't just mementos, they were remnants, shadows of lives cut grievously short. The days of the trial wore heavy on the hearts of the townspeople. Can you imagine it? The heavy mood, the somber understanding that justice was not just about punishment but a testament, an atonement for every unspoken dream dreams that had been brutally stolen away. After the evidentiary hearings, after the indictment and pleadings ceased echoing through the chamber, the jury was left to deliberate the legacy of Martin Dumoulard. And as dusk approached on February 1st, the court reconvened to finally heed the answers to a litany of charges, a chorus affirming guilt and sealing destinies. The crowd erupted as the punishment was declared. Dumoulard would meet his end by the blade, the same guillotine that had been ominously awaiting its cue since the trial's beginning. His wife, though not sentenced to death, would not walk away unscathed. Twenty years of penal labor awaited her. Yet what resounded within the courtroom and beyond its walls was not triumph, but a sober relief. A killer had been thwarted, justice served, yet the cost was etched into history, and the wounds of a community would take more than a verdict to heal. With the sentence handed down, Martin Dumoulard's days were numbered. The man who wrought terror upon the unsuspecting maids of Lyon faced the ultimate retribution for his crimes, the guillotine. This device, synonymous with swift and egalitarian justice during the French Revolution, would now draw a bloody curtain on this sordid chapter of crime. Incarcerated in Bourg-en-Bresse, Dumoulard's cell would become the unlikely intersection of religion and morbidity. Visits from lawyers became a prelude to the spiritual ministrations of Father Baroud. Even the Bishop of Belly set foot in this grim abode, extending a sanctioned salvation to a soul that had wandered so far from redemption. Yet, amid the prayers and blessings, Dumoulard maintained a detached disinterest, offering defiance to the end. As his final moments inched closer, an eerie detail emerged that arrested the public's attention almost as much as the heinous nature of his crimes, the disappearance of his head. Following the execution, Dumoulard's body was laid to rest at an undisclosed location, presumably by the St. Bartholomew's Chapel, yet his head embarked on a morbid journey of its own. Dispatched to Lyon Medical School, it became an artifact of forensic fascination, subjected to the scrutiny of cast plasters and eventually a resurgence of interest that peeled back yet another layer of this complex man. The angioma on his lip, once a mere identifying feature, gained a new dark significance as it was linked to the man behind the myth. What did the examination of this one man's skull reveal about the nature of serial killers? Did the cold calculus of phrenology hold the key? Or did it merely sharpen the questions about what drives such individuals to commit their unspeakable acts? Dumoulard, even in death, continued to puzzle and provoke discussions around the definition and understanding of serial killers in Europe. This grim finale played out in early dawn's silence, punctuated only by the ominous construction of the scaffold in Place Carnot. Dumoulard met his end as crowds of onlookers bore witness to the cold, mechanical justice of the guillotine. The sharp blade's fall was not just the end of a man, but an uncompromising statement against serial murder, clarifying the collective revulsion and absolute denouncement of such acts. Dumoulard's story had sown terror and turmoil, but in his death, there was a solemn hope for peace and a fervent prayer that such evils would not visit again. His crimes became the dark shadows from which society would strive to emerge, illuminated, however grimly, by the untiring efforts to understand the minds that perpetrate such darkness. And as the guillotine's blade settled, the world whispered a hope. May justice keep us safe from such horror, and may we learn from this never to let such a terror rise again. As our journey into the grim tale of Martin Dumoulard draws to a close, it's critical to reflect on the deeper implications his story has on our current understanding of the dark undercurrents of human nature. This case, soaked in blood and shadowed by the gallows, reaches beyond the realm of historical crime and into the heart of the very forces that drive individuals to become serial killers. Dumoulard's life, a tapestry woven with threads of neglect, familial criminality, and societal estrangement, stands as a stark reminder of the complex interplay between psychological disposition and social environment. 
Psychologists today delve into the fabric of killers like Dumoulard, searching for the twisted fibers of their psyche. Was it the traumatic spectacle of his father's brutal execution that set young Martin on a path of violence? Or did the pronounced alienation and poverty sculpt his heart into that of a ruthless predator? Sociologically, Martin Dumoulard emerged in a time where the mechanisms of law enforcement and forensic science were yet primitive. His ability to evade capture for years highlights the difficulties faced by societies in identifying and apprehending those who dwell in their midst with malicious intent. It calls into question the safety nets of our current society. Even now, with our advancements, how many Dumoulards walk amongst us unseen, slipping through the cracks of overburdened legal institutions and allocating their crimes to the cold case files? Importantly, Dumoulard's narrative imposes upon us the chilling reality that evil need not be the work of some distant other. It can emerge from within our communities, wearing a familiar face, speaking with a known accent. His crimes feed into an age-long societal fear that there is no surefire defense against those who harbor darkness within, for they cannot always be readily seen or understood. Furthermore, the notoriety of Martin Dumoulard seeps into the cultural consciousness becoming a touchstone for the macabre fascination that society holds for the morbid and grotesque. His tale is a testament to the eternal human quest to grapple with the concept of evil, to define it, contain it, and perhaps foolishly, to control it. As we contemplate the story of Martin de Mollard, the so-called predator of Lyon, we ask ourselves, what drives a human being to repeat acts of supreme violence? How do we reconcile the existence of such individuals with our own sense of morality and justice? These questions linger, haunting our consciousness, echoing through the chambers of our minds long after the tales of their deeds have been told. The complex webs woven by the likes of Dumoulard remain subjects of fascination and horror well into our present day, not merely as historical accounts but as caverns of human experience yet to be fully understood. They challenge us to look closer to decipher the signs, to extend our empathy even to those who cannot reciprocate it, all in the pursuit of preventing future tragedies from unfolding in the quiet shadows of our societies. And just like the dimly lit alleyways that once echoed with the hurried footsteps of the hapless victims of Martin Dumoulard, we find ourselves at a crossroad at the end of another dark narrative, this tale of deceit, murder, and a chilling glimpse into the nature of human depravity raises the inevitable unsettling question. What is the essence of evil? Is it birthed in the shadows of one's upbringing, or does it slither its way into a person's soul through the experiences they endure? I invite you to share your insights, your theories, or any inklings you might have regarding this macabre story and what molds a monster of such nature. Let our conversation ignite further investigation into the abyss that is true crime. Remember, by subscribing to The Real Crime Diary, you become a part of a community that seeks to uncover the mysteries that lurk in the dark corners of history. So don't hesitate to like, comment, and share your thoughts on this episode. Your engagement helps us grow and continue to bring the most harrowing and true tales from the Crime Diary. Until next time, keep your wits about you and never shy away from unearthing the truth.